Okay, so let's uh, restart the class. So, uh, I had a couple of questions uh, during the break time. So just one of them was about uh, explaining the uh, each equation, right? So we have kind of the two basic equations for present and future value. I know the future value, find the present value, right? I know the present value, find the future value. Then we have, after this, we start moving into annuities. And what we want to do with an annuity is, annuity really is a, a sum of present values. Because if I am a company, I invest $10,000 today, okay? Then year one, I'm going to make $3,000. Year two, $3,000. Year three, $3,000. Okay, what I can do, I can use the simple present value equation to find out how much is this $3,000 worth today. I can use the simple present value to find out how much is this $3,000 worth today. Okay, I can use the simple present value to find out how much is this $3,000 worth today. And then I can add them together. Okay? The present value of this plus the present value of this plus the present value of this. Right? And if they are different numbers, I need to do it that way. Okay? But if they are the same number, we call this an annuity, and we can use an easier equation. We don't have to calculate each one. Say it's 10 years, it's going to be a lot of work, right? So instead of calculating the present value of each year for 10 years and adding it together, which is a lot of work, we can just use the equation. Okay? We have four different equations for the annuities. One is that uh, we know the annuity, we want to find the present value. So if we know this annuity, how much is the present value? Two is we know the annuity, how much is the future value? Okay? The next one is we know the present value, how much is the annuity? This is like mortgage. Okay? The next one is, we know the future value. This is like saving for the pension. How much is the annuity? Okay, so those are the main equations that you need to know. So, uh, if you want to read more about that, we gave the link for the book, which is on the website or here. So we can see we're talking about the objective in decision making today. Okay? There is a, here, appendix. We already talked about financial statements and accounting. And we have another appendix, time value of money. Okay? And I'll put up the uh, <coughs> questions that you had today and the answer on the website. Okay? And some other questions if you want to practice. So you can see. <coughs> another question I had was about compound interest. It is a little bit confusing. So, say that I'm paying monthly instead of yearly. I pay $300 every month, okay? So from month one to month 12, I'm paying $300 a month. The interest rate is 10%, okay? So monthly interest rate, let's say the interest rate is 12%. Monthly interest rate is 1%, okay? So I'm at the end of month one, how much am I going to pay? Uh, I'm going to pay $300, okay? So, then we have to add on in month two, or say that it's 1% of $300, so say $3, $3 is interest. So the next month it's going to be $303, okay? What's 1% of 303? 3.03, .03, okay? Then the next month, I'm going to have 303, sorry, 306.3, okay? What's that? That's 3.063. The next month, it's going to be 3.09, right? So on, okay? So the point is that every month, we're paying a little bit more than the last month in interest. Okay? So, in the end, our interest bill at the end of the year is going to be higher than if we pay just 12%, right? 
If I pay 12% of 300, how much is that? 1% is 3, so 12% is 36, right? So is my bill of interest going to be 36 if I pay monthly? It's going to be higher than 36, okay? How much higher than 36? We have an equation to calculate <coughs> how much higher than 36, okay? A little bit higher than 36, maybe 39 or 40. So our effective annual interest rate then is not 12%, it's going to be 13% instead of 12%. Right, so if we are paying monthly, we have to think about the effect of compound interest. Okay? If we're paying yearly, it's not a problem. If we're paying monthly, then we need, instead of doing the calculation yearly, we should do the calculation monthly, then we don't have to worry about com the compound interest. Okay? Just do the calculation monthly. That's a better way. Okay? <coughs> so, any more questions about that? So just, uh, I know some people ask me at the break time, but if, it's a good idea to ask in front of the class too, because if you have a question, I'm sure that there are people in the class <coughs> who also have the same, the same question. Okay? So let's continue then with the objective in financial management. So the last time we were talking about where things can go wrong, okay? And we were talking about stockholders and managers and so on. Uh, just the other day in the news, I saw that Barclays Bank in the UK, they got it, they are in the news because the managers got double their bonus this year. So 11 of the top executives or managers in the company got a bonus of something like 35 million pounds. So each manager got a bonus average about 3 million pounds. Do you think that's a good bonus for one year's work? Yes. 3 million pounds? Right? But the controversial thing is it's double last year's bonus. Last year they got 1.5 million pounds. Okay? But they did a worse job than last year. They, did, they made less profit than last year. So how can it be that the managers got double the bonus, even though they made less profit? What do you think? How can that be? Are the stockholders controlling the managers well? Or are the managers putting their interest above stockholders? What do you think? In Barclays Bank, big bank in the UK. Do you think the managers are putting their interest above the stockholders? Paying themselves really big bonuses, even though they're not doing a good job. Why? Right? So that's an example. So that's a big issue at the moment in the US and Europe. Bankers' bonuses, especially during the financial crisis, when a lot of banks lost a lot of money, but the managers still got big bonuses. Okay? So people are saying that the board of directors should resign in Barclays Bank because the board of directors are not supervising the managers properly, especially the board of directors who is responsible for compensation. There's a sub subsection of board of directors who are responsible for compensation and they shouldn't be allowing the managers to have big bonuses. So we saw that the annual meeting, maybe I own stock in Barclays Bank, I'm not going to go to the annual meeting and explain it. It's not worth my while. The mutual funds, the institutional investors, they're not going to go, they're not going to complain. They, they just agree with the managers, we saw here. Okay? Board of directors, very well paid. They could be insiders, have some link to the managers. Maybe they play golf together. Okay? They're not, maybe they're not going to complain. So, we talked about that. Then the next one we're going to talk about is uh, stockholders and bondholders. So stockholders and bondholders have different objectives. If I own a company or I lend money to the company, I have a different objective. Okay? If I own the company, I want to make a good profit. I'm going to be more likely to take risk. If I lend money to a company, what's the only way I, can, I won't get my money back? If I lend money to a company, 
What's the only case where I won't get my money back? The company goes bankrupt. Do you understand bankrupt? Even if the company goes bankrupt, what will happen? The lenders control the assets. So I'll get some money back. Okay? So your company goes bankrupt. Then the people who lent you money is going to get your a factory and equipment and so on. Okay? And they can sell that. They won't get back all their money. So bondholders are mainly concerned that the company doesn't go bankrupt. As long as the company stays in business, they get paid the same. I buy a bond for $1 million, I have 5% interest every year, okay? If the company makes 50% profit one year, do I get paid more than 5% or still get paid 5% as a bondholder? The company made a really big profit, do I get more than 5% or just the same? The same, right? Bondholder lends money, they get paid interest. The interest doesn't change whether the company is doing well or badly. Okay? I make a loss of 50%, bondholder still gets paid their interest. Okay? So the bondholder is very concerned about stability and not they don't want any risk in the company. Okay? So bondholders are concerned about safety, getting their money back. If you lend money to your family, do you want them to take a big risk with your money? No. They can lose the money, right? You want them to do something very safe with the money. So you can be sure to get paid back. Stockholders want to take more risk. They want to make profit with the money. So how can we see examples of the conflict here? Do bondholders want high dividends? Dividends is giving the profits back to the stockholder. What does the bondholder prefer? Money is kept in the company or given back to the stockholders? Kept in the company, of course, right? Keep the money in the company, the company is less risky. Pay out all the money to the owners, the stockholders, more risky. Taking riskier projects than those agreed at the start. So I invest with your company and you tell me you're going to do a very safe project. Then two months later, you start taking very risky projects. Okay? Then I feel like uh, that's conflicting with what I wanted. And I could get hurt. Borrowing more and more. So you lend money from me. I give, you have 50% of your money, and I lend you 50% for your business. Right? So I think that's fine. 50-50, it's okay. Not too bad. She's using 50% of her money. So she has, we say in uh, English, there's a saying, she has some skin in the game. It means that you're going to get hurt. In the US they use a lot of uh, sports metaphors, right? If we're playing football, you're involved in the game and you can get injured or get hurt. So you have some skin in the game, you have 50% of your own money. So I think you want the company to do very well, okay? So I lend you 50%. Then you go and you lend money from all these people. So in the end, your money is just 5% and your debt is 95%. Am I happy? No, why not? I thought I was investing in a company which was 50-50, debt and equity, right? Now I'm investing in a company which is 95. Okay, I'm lending to a company which is 95 debt, very risky very high interest payments. So we can have this kind of conflict. The bondholder doesn't want the company to take on debt, but the stockholder, and we saw in the financial crisis, the manager. The manager wanted more debt, so they could have a better ROE, return on equity, and get a better bonus. Then the next one is the financial markets. So in theory, Financial markets are efficient. A company invests in good long-term <coughs> projects will be rewarded. The stock price will go up. People will buy stock in the company. They're making nice decisions. In practice, there are some holes in the efficient market theory. We mentioned uh, briefly already. 
So one problem is information is suppressed or delayed by managers seeking a better time to release it. If you're a manager, which is a better time to tell the public bad news? On Monday morning, just as the stock market opens, or Friday evening, just as the stock market closes? Why is it better to tell them on Friday evening? Or on Saturday? Why is it better to tell them on Saturday when the stock markets are closed? From the manager's point of view. Because people cannot sell the stock. They can't sell the stock, right? They have time to think about it. Right? Maybe on Monday people will start panicking and everybody will start selling the stock. The stock price will keep going down. People will copy. On Friday evening or Saturday, people have Saturday and Sunday to think about it. They don't have to panic. They can say, maybe the news is not that bad. Okay? So you'll notice that a lot of companies and even the governments, when they give some bad news, it's at the weekend when people are, the markets are not open. We see the EU, the problems with Greece, right? They make some negative announcement, probably make it on a Saturday, right? So people have time to think about it. So, in that case, the company could be delaying the information. Companies could also release misleading information about their conditions. So we spoke before about the gold mine in, in Canada. They said, oh, this land is just normal, normal land. We're not sure if there's gold there or not. But they knew there was a lot of gold there, and they told all their friends, okay? Uh, also, it could be some bad news, like uh, we know that there is an oil spill. Our company had some bad accident, right? But first we tell all our friends, quick, sell the stock, right? The stock price is going to go down. And then later we tell the public <coughs> about that. So uh, in that case, uh, financial markets are not going to show the correct price. So. This graph shows, do managers today bad news? Okay, so uh, <coughs> we can see here that the managers on Friday, the uh, stock market is going down more. Okay, so we can see that stock market is going up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Usually the stock market is going down. What's a good day to buy stocks, if you look at this graph? Thursday evening, good day to buy stocks? Good time to buy stocks? Monday, okay, so it seems that a lot of companies are waiting to release their bad news on Friday. Why? Right? Or Friday afternoon or Friday evening, the stock goes down. Instead of... Uh, the other way around. So... Uh, other critiques of market efficiency, investors are irrational, so people don't act in a rational man manner. Uh, Rob Schiller is, is a famous uh, Yale professor who studies about, he's very interested in animal spirits. He wrote a book called Animal Spirits. Do you understand animal spirits? Like the psychology of the markets, okay? So he did that kind of research on Wall Street. He asked people, why are you selling your stock? And they said, everybody else is selling their stock. That's why I'm selling my stock, okay? So herding is like an animal behavior, following the other animals, okay? So bubbles, bubbles are a price that markets are not efficient, the price is way too high, suddenly comes down, okay? Do you understand bubble? Do you like blowing bubbles? Do you like blowing bubbles at the weekend? No? Okay, usually kids blow bubbles, right? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then what happens? Burst, right? So, it's the same for financial markets. People keep investing, keeps going up, then burst, suddenly the price goes down. So that means the market is not efficient. Why? If it was efficient, we wouldn't have these big and sudden changes in prices. People would be intelligently analyzing the information, and the prices would be more like this, right? So, in, investors can overreact to bad news and good news. Some people's trading strategy is, whenever there's very bad news about a company, 
they buy a stock. Right? Why? For example, BP had the oil disaster in 2008 or 2009, right? Then my friend decides to buy some stock in BP. Now BP stock price is maybe, I don't know, 400 or 500% higher than it was in 2008, right? So some people try to take advantage of this overreaction by trading, okay? They think there's bad news. People overreact. Do you understand overreact? Yes. They go too far. The news was not that bad, but people kept selling. Then I can buy when it's very cheap, and in the long term, the price can come back up again. Okay? So, <coughs> financial markets can be manipulated by insiders. In France, this is why French people don't trade stocks much. They think it's a little bit like horse ra racing. That the inside people know about the horses, Maybe they could even organize. Uh, this time, this horse is going to win. Next time, this horse is going to win, right? So in France, they're very suspicious about inside information. Like I talked about with the gold mine. Okay? So in that case, that there's a lot of inside information and insider trading, then price is not the same as value. Another critique is that the investors are short-sighted and don't think about the long term. So if a company makes a decision, investors are not thinking, oh well, uh, after five years that will be good, so I'll buy the stock. Maybe they're thinking in one year it won't be good, so I should sell the stock. So that it's another uh, criticism. So here's a question uh, to discuss with your partner. Following and worrying about daily stock prices in the market will lead companies towards short-term decisions at the expense of long-term value. So I'll discuss. Do you agree or don't agree? So if the managers are very worried about our stock price, right? The short-term stock price. We want to keep the stock price high in the short term. Does that mean we're going to make a lot of short-term decisions <coughs> instead of decisions which would make a long-term impact. Okay? The kind of decision which would make a long-term impact would be like helping the environment, right? We make a system so that we don't use much water in our company. Okay? Instead, of, instead of using water, we use another system, which is better for the environment. But in the short term, it's more expensive. But in the long term, it could be better because the, the price of water will go up. The government will make new legislation. Okay? So that could be a good decision for the long term, helping the environment, but not a good decision for the short term. Right? So if managers are just thinking about the stock price, do you think that affects their decision making? So discuss with your partner. Some people agree, some people don't agree. So, 
generally, if we are thinking about the short term, very worried about the short term, what we are thinking about is here, not so much the manager, <coughs> people who are buying the stock. Because if we make a long term decision, if the people who are buying the stock realize that's a good decision, then the stock price will go up in the short term, right? So if we, we really this question is asking, uh, are invest, do investors think about the short term or the long term, right? So we make this kind of decision for the water. In the short term, are investors going to say, yes, that's a good decision. I think that's a long term value for the company. So I'm going to buy the stock. Then our short term stock price can go up, right? So it's not really clear whether uh, the investors are short term or long term. <coughs> but, so it's not clear.